In this presentation, we're going to look at the role of uh, pedigrees and how are they used to uh, trace the inheritance of characteristics. So specifically, the, the dot point is perform an investigation to construct pedigrees or family trees, trace the inheritance of selected characteristics, and discuss their current use. First of all, we're going to just define this term pedigree chart. So it, a pedigree chart is used to determine the genotype of related individuals based on their phenotype for a particular characteristic. So the word genotype. Genotype refers to the all the genotype. It refers to uh, the genes that are present and we can't see them. However, genotypes are made up of uh, alleles, which are variations of a gene. So alleles, the variations. variations of a gene and we know in general terms a lot of the work that Mendel was doing they looked at uh, there being dominant and recessive alleles so for each trait there will be a dominant allele which will uh, will mask the the recessive allele so they show dominance also know that there are uh, for a for a, a specific gene, for a specific gene, there are two alternatives. So each each human or each organism has two alternatives, and these are carried on the homologous chromosomes, which is one chromosome from the father and one chromosome from the mother, and these are given to the individual at fertilisation. So that's all about genotype. The next bit is phenotype. And this relates to physical appearance. Physical appearance. And finally, we are looking for a particular characteristic. Okay, so it's for a particular characteristic. We'll study one characteristic at a time. So another way of looking at uh, this idea of a pedigree chart is, is the pattern of inheritance of observable traits. And the pattern of inheritance of observable traits and is used to determine each individual's genotype. So we might be looking at such things as uh, the length of the second toe in humans. Uh, there is a alternative allele of uh, second toe is longer or second toe is shorter. So they are your alternate characteristics. So we can look at the inheritance pattern of that and determine whether, number one, whether it's a, a dominant or recessive trait, which one is, uh, the long or the short second toe. We can also work out the prevalence uh, of that, uh, of the inheritance of that characteristic based off that. And finally, we hope to be able to work out the genotypes of individuals based on looking at that uh, physical feature. So before we get started looking at pedigrees, what we're going to do is look at some uh, internationally recognisable symbols uh, that help us to determine uh, sex of individuals, if they carry the trait, and, and how each of the individuals are related. So first of all, males are drawn as uh, squares. Females are drawn as a circle. Now the male and a female produce offspring. We use a horizontal line between the two. Now the next part looks at this idea of a descent line. So this is looking at the uh, the offspring of a male and female. So we'll just carry on a line down from the centre of them. So we use a vertical line, and we can see their offspring. We don't connect the offspring because that would mean that they have had offspring between them and, and that's not a desirable uh, thing so we we show them as coming off the parents so we can see in this example that that man and woman have had uh, a boy a girl and another boy the other way of drawing descent lines would be if they had twins so twins would be drawn off the same point, and if they're identical twins, 
then they they would be both girls or both boys. If they were unidentical twins, they would be. So if they are unidentical twins, we would still see a line coming off together, and we would see that they are different sexes. Of course, they can also be unidentical and be of the same sex. However, that's a little bit harder to show in uh, these pedigree charts. So what we're going to look at now is how we show if an individual is affected or uh, displays uh, the trait that's being studied. So not everything is, a, is about a bit in the disease that we're trying to work out. Uh, some things are just about a trait that we're studying. So if we're looking at a male that displays that trait, we would draw a we would draw a square and then colour it in. And then same for a female. So these are both individuals. So these are both individuals that uh, display a trait. So they display trait. Now at this point, it doesn't tell us if that trait is dominant or recessive. So it doesn't tell us if it's dominant or recessive. It just says that they have the trait. The problem-solving part of it comes in uh, when we try to determine if it is a dominant recessive trait. Based on uh, based on the information that we've given in the trait in the chart. So individuals who are not affected again, males would be a square. That's a male not affected and a female not affected. So they don't just display the trait. They don't dis display trait. So the following is an example of a pedigree and I'm going to uh, annotate it as we go. So for, to start off with we have a, a male and married to a female and they have three children. So our line goes across to say that they have an offspring together and then our line, our vertical line down says that they have had offspring. Now in this case the offspring are going to be three males. Of course your diagrams will be much neater than this. Now this particular male is married or has, has offspring and they have two boys. Lots of boys in this family. Now if we wanted to display a trait, we're not necessarily going to work out whether that trait is dominant or recessive. We want to display a trait. We would colour in those individuals who are displaying that particular trait. So we can see that some of the males are carrying it but none of the females are carrying it. Now to identify those individuals in the pedigree, there is a couple of things that we do. We use Roman numerals to determine the generation. So our first generation, or the grandparents, our second generation, the three boys, with one of the boys married to uh, to a female, to a woman, and the third generation with three, uh, with two boys. So we can assign each of the individuals a uh, from each generation a number, and we start at we start at one. Okay, so down here we have one, two, three, hopefully. That doesn't keep on deleting it, and four. And in our final generation, the two boys, we have one, we have two. Okay. You may also see this occasionally that they continue the numbering. So one, two, 
and then they drop down to the second generation and go three, four, five, six. Uh, that are sometimes the older style uh, questions you may see. Uh, a lot of the newer textbooks would use this. So uh, Roman numerals to indicate the generation and numbers to indicate the individual. So if we wanted to talk about this individual here. Let's highlight that in individual. If we wanted to talk about this individual here, we would say that that individual is from the second generation. So they're the second generation and they're the third individual from that generation. Okay, so that is that person there. Okay, so recapping what we've done, we've shown that males are squares and female are circles and if they have produced offspring there is a horizontal line between them and the offspring or the descendants are shown by a descending line and we see that there are three boys and this third boy number two uh, second generation number three is, is uh, married or has had children and they have also had two boys in the final part of this presentation, what we're going to look at is how we solve problems using uh, pedigree charts. So we can see uh, we have a, a diagram below with a little bit of an introduction. It says the diagram shows a family tree for short eyelashes. Okay, so a family tree for short eyelashes. And then it says long eyelashes are dominant over short eyelashes. Therefore, we're looking at a recessive trait because the condition, the coloured in one, this is is, uh, is the short eyelashes, and then it says long eyelashes are dominant over short eyelashes. So now we can think about assigning genotypes to each of the individuals. However, before we do that, we might give them letters. So I think eyelashes, uh, the E from eyelashes would be a good letter. So we'll put this down here, and we will say long being the dominant long eyelashes and we will say that, that is a capital E and short ones is a lowercase e okay so first of all we know if, if something is uh, we're, we're uh, looking at a, a trait the short eyelashes and that is we know for that to show for the, the recessive trait to show that an individual must have both the alleles as as little e's. Okay, so we can see these coloured in ones will all then be recessive for short eyelashes. Okay, so next we need to work out whether an individual is uh, dominant, uh, so homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. So the way that's written would be uh, for homozygous dominant. So they have all these uncolored ones are long eyelashes, and there are the homozygous dominant, which would be capital E, capital E or they are heterozygous and they would be capital E, little e. So our first individual, our male number one in the first generation here, has married a short eyelashed woman and we can see in their children numbers two, not three because they're not joined to that descending line, but two, four, five, six, eight, and nine, that we have a mixture. So let's highlight them. So we have a mixture between individuals with short eyelashes and long eyelashes. So what that tells us is that individual Roman number one, number one, is going to be heterozygous. So they're going to be capital E, little e. The reason for that, and if we were to do a Punnett square of that, and we might just try and squeeze a Punnett square in down the bottom just to prove this point, 
if we were to show a Punnett square of this particular trait, very small I know, mother is little e, little e, and the father, capital E, little e, if we were to do a cross there, we can see that that would, is the only way we can see if an individual uh, can, can have either the short eyelashes or the long eyelashes. If both of, if this was homozygous dominant, then all of them would be hybrids. So it's like a first generation cross of the parents who are both homozygous. So individual one is heterozygous, long eyelashes. What can we determine from the rest? Well, from here, uh, from our Punnett square down the bottom here, we can see that if an individual is to have long eyelashes, the only possible outcome they can have, so let's highlight that, the only possible outcome they can have would be to be heterozygous. So individuals 2, 6, 8 and 9 must then also be heterozygous themselves. So 2 is going to be heterozygous, 6 is heterozygous, 8 and 9. So that leaves us with only a couple more people in the second generation to determine their genotypes and then we can look at the final generation. So let's look at number one in the second generation, the male married to the female who is heterozygous. If we look at their offspring, we can see that one of them, let's highlight that individual, the girl has long eyelashes. So if we were to do a Punnett square cross again, we would know that the only way that individual two in, the genera in generation three can receive a, an allele for short eyelashes from both parents is that if individual one was heterozygous as well. Now, number three, we can see that uh, three is married to a, a female with long eyelashes and they have one child, a female, with also long eyelashes. So there's not enough information here because a cross with either homozygous or heterozygous for number three would still produce a child who is homozygous or heterozygous as well. So we can't determine them fully. We know that they are long eyelashes, but we don't know if they are homozygous or heterozygous. Individual number seven, female married to a long eyelashed, uh, a long eyelashed male. If we take a look at individuals six and seven's children, we see that they have a long uh, eyelashed individual, number four, and a short eyelashed male, number five. Therefore, for number five to receive both uh, alleles from, from the parents as, uh, as the recessive, the little e, then individual seven must have a recessive trait hidden in the background. That is the only way that they can give, each of them can give a recessive allele to number five. Number four, again, there is not as much information. So we, we can't determine fully, number four, they could be either homozygous dominant, so long eyelashes definitely, homozygous dominant, or heterozygous, a hybrid of it, both for carrying a dominant and a recessive allele. So the only one to look at then is individual one, uh, number three, and, and again we're in the same position as individual four in generation three, is that because both parents are heterozygous, it is plausible that they could be homozygous long eyelashes or heterozygous eyelash, uh, long eyelashes. So we can't determine individual one completely.